a kid, I was not the best student always in Hebrew school. And I remember I had a principal once who gave me a, uh, you know, a little bit of a Jewish curse that someday I would go into Jewish education myself. And when I think about the questions that kids ask, I was one of those students that asked those kinds of questions. I remember in middle school, in our English class, we were going to read a book that I'd already read before. So I asked the teacher, why do I have to read it again? Right, I had him give me questions, and I could answer his questions. So I said, what's the point? Why should I read this book again? And the answer he gave me was he paraphrased one of the Greek philosophers who says, you can never stand in the same river twice. Right? Every time you go into that river, the water has changed and moved. In the same way, you can't read the same book twice, as opposed to the book changing. The lesson is that we change. Each time we read it, we are different. And I relate that back now to our Parsha, because I mentioned before, in Hebrew it's called Devarim. It's the book of words. But the English name for it is Deuteronomy. And it literally means, right, the second law. That's what this book is about. It is a second telling of the law. The rabbis actually at one point referred to it as the Mishnah Torah, the second law. Right? Rambam, Amadides used that later for his law code. But at a point in rabbinic history, that's how they referred to the book of Devarim as the second law. Because the book of Devarim is not words about the future, but it's words about the past. As they stood at the edge of Israel at the border of the Jordan River. Moses didn't tell them about the land flowing with milk and honey, the future temple, the things that would be built, the civilization, the culture, and everything that would come to pass. Instead, Moses told them about the journey they had just been on. He reviewed the highlights. He reviewed the difficulties, the struggles. He didn't take anything out. He talked about their disappointments, their failures. And there's something important about sharing our stories and retelling them again and again and again. Not only our triumphs, but our struggles. As we prepare for Tisha B'Av, I want to share with you a story, an excerpt from the diaries of Hillel Seedman. It comes from what he wrote that's collected and published as the Warsaw Ghetto Diaries. July 22nd, 1942. I walk out into the street as does everybody else, thirsting for news of the rumored deportations, only to discover that this morning, the ghetto has been surrounded by the Ukrainian militia. These include some Latvians and Lithuanians, angels of destruction of every type. Anyone approaching the walls is shot on spot. We are ensnared in a trap. He goes on and describes being caught with thousands of other Jews funneled by armed guards to the waiting areas at the train station. They're cattle cars. Freight wagons used for transporting animals are waiting to take them to their death. He continues. And so we march, old and young, women and children, rich and poor, in lines of eight abreast, according to the German system, and are many thousands, and the crowd stretches back as far as the eye can see. Everybody presses tightly together, so united in suffering, so totally in this moment, in Amichad, one people. Never before have I sensed so palpably the strands which bind us as Jews together, our common cause, our united purpose, like I do today on the death march. Simon actually managed to escape deportation. But thousands of men, women, and children didn't that day and were loaded onto those cattle cars and taken to their death. But that night, as he returned to his quarters in the ghetto, he wrote this. As I finally reach home, my brain bursting with terrifying images. Crossing our courtyard, I notice the small shtibel, the synagogue. About 20 men sit on upturned benches. Tonight is Tisha B'Av. Two flickering candles at the temporary prayer stand dimly light upon the bent heads with their eyes staring to the far distance as a heart-trending tune wells up from Echa, the Book of Lamentations. And here he intersperses his own thoughts with quotes from the book. The tune that was perhaps first composed at exile from Jerusalem has since absorbed the tears of generations. How alone Jerusalem sits, the great city of many inhabitants. Indeed, how alone, how forlorn we are today. 
All Jerusalem's pursuers entrapped in her dire straits. I called to my friends, but they betrayed me. How true, how real those ancient lamentations read, how accurate they describe our present catastrophe. We Jews of Warsaw, the sons of those exiles, sit on the ground to mourn our own personal korban, the destruction of a major community, the largest and most vigorous in Europe. We weep at our fate, a nation without land, but in the grasp of our fiercest enemy, condemned to death. We grieve both for the loss of the Holy Temple and the extinction of our lives. It was June 22, 1942, when he wrote this, that the first trainload of Jews arrived at Treblinka. Tisha B'Av that year marked the opening and beginning of one of the camps that killed hundreds of thousands. And I tell you this this morning not because I want to depress you, but I know it's a heavy topic. But because this Parsha, this day, Tisha B'Av, remind me always how important it is that we as Jews remember the past, that we tell our stories. Today is the ninth of Av, Tisha B'Av, but because it's Shabbat, the commemoration of mourning doesn't begin until tonight and goes until tomorrow night. It's postponed. But the day is observed with mourning practices. We fast, we sit on stools or low chairs, we read from the Book of Lamentations, we recite keynote poems of mourning, remembering moments of pain and destruction, sadness. But 2,000 years later, after the destruction of the temple, we're supposed to mourn it as if it happened yesterday. Over the course of the three weeks, from the 17th of Tammuz until today, the mourning gets stronger and stronger, more and more strict. Usually, for anyone that's ever lost somebody, if you've been a halakhic mourner, you know that usually it's the other way around. We start during the week of Shiva with the most extreme, the most strict mourning practices. And as that goes into the shloshim, it gets lighter. As that goes into the first year, if it's for a parent, it continues to get lighter. And for the years following that, while we continue to remember people on yurt sites, on yiskers, the restrictions halakhically become lighter. And yet, for Tisha B'Av, it's the opposite. Each year we start with the fewest restrictions, moving up to the day where they are the strongest. And the rabbis ask and answer their own question about why it is that we do it this way. And they tell us that it was instituted so we could remember the importance of this day. So it wouldn't be just a memorial day where we remember some tragedy happened to our ancestors long ago, but that each year we would feel as if we were the ones who lost our temple, that we lost our sovereignty in the land, that we lost our communal identity. I had a teacher who tells the story that his brother worked at a big law firm, and every year they would have an annual company picnic. And one year that picnic took place on Tisha B'Av. So he wrote a memo to everyone saying that he could not attend. Why? Because his temple was destroyed. For him, it felt real. For everyone who read that memo, they comforted him as if the synagogue he went to each Shabbat had just burned down. But for most of us, that's not how we feel when we think about Tisha B'Av and the destruction of the temple. It's something long ago. If you've been to Israel, perhaps it's even harder to identify with it, to mourn the destruction, the loss of Jewish sovereignty, when you can stand in the Holy Land. You can feel the rocks, the stones in Jerusalem beneath your feet. You can feel the wind in your hair. It's hard sometimes to relate because the tragedy feels distant. For much of Jewish history on Tisha B'Av, we were commemorated not just the destruction of the temple, but each generation adding on their current problems, their sufferings, their tragedies. We remember the expulsion and the death of the countless Jews in France and the Rhineland, the Crusades, the expulsion of Jews from countries like England, France, Spain on Tisha B'Av. But these two are distant to us. 
I began with this story about the Shoah. Because I'm part of what amongst rabbis happens to be a minority opinion. In the modern era after the Shoah, we created Yom HaShoah, a day to memorialize and remember the Holocaust, to remember the victims of it. And it's an important holiday. But we took something away from Tisha B'Av when our modern suffering wasn't added to it, wasn't included in it. Turns out I'm not entirely alone. Menachem Begin shares my view. But Tisha B'Av is becoming, for many, especially in the non-Orthodox world, in liberal Jewish communities, a day that's mostly gone unobserved, forgotten about. A day that the stories and tragedies of our past aren't recounted and remembered. And this is why I think it's so important. Because for us in this generation, especially here at Beth Torah, a synagogue founded by survivors, many of you the children and grandchildren of those who saw the most extreme evil in the entire history of the world and survived and rebuilt their lives here in Toronto. For others, the stories are distant. The same way I gave my teachers trouble, why do I have to hear this again? I once had a student ask me that for Yom HaShoah and we were going to hear a survivor speak. We heard a survivor last year. We heard a survivor the year before. Why do we have to hear again? Isn't there something else we can do to observe Yom HaShoah? But the answer is right here in our Parsha. We tell the stories. We tell them again and again and again so they feel real, so they are not forgotten. We tell the stories of those who survived and those who perished. We tell the stories of our ancestors who were expelled from Spain and France, who were murdered in the name of the Crusades, or in the conquest by the Romans of our sacred temple and our city and our country. Because that's what we have to do. If we don't tell those stories each and every year, they'll be lost. So the story is probably apocryphal, but nonetheless, I think it's worth ending on. That Napoleon was once passing through the Jewish ghetto in Paris, and he heard the sound of crying and wailing coming from a small synagogue. He stopped to ask, what tragedy was it that made the Jews of this city cry like so? They said their temple was destroyed. He asked when it happened and was told it was roughly 1,700 years ago. And the answer Napoleon is said to have given is that a people who never forget their past are destined to always have a future. This is Shabbat Chazon. It's a Shabbat of vision. But our tradition tells us very, very clearly that the vision of the future only matters when it's connected to the past, to the stories, the good and the bad that we shared as a people, as a community, both today and throughout history. And so that's my prayer for this week and our lesson, that stories of our collective memory can never be shared too much or too often, that however you observe Tisha B'Av, whether you fast or you don't, whether you go to synagogue or you don't, whether you read the book of Echa or not, take time tonight and tomorrow and think about these stories. Think about where our people have come from. And together, if we remember that, we can build a future. Shabbat Shalom.